Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are headed for an incredible interview today because our guest is Mr. Doug Casey. Doug is the founder and chairman of CaseyResearch.com. He is a best-selling author, including the book Crisis Investing. He has appeared on hundreds of shows from Merv Griffin and David Letterman to CNN. He's been the topic of articles in the Times, Forbes, People Magazine, and the Washington Post because Doug is one of the most successful and experienced investors in the world. Our team is excited to have him here on the show today because of his brutal honesty and phenomenal advice. Doug, welcome to the show. How are you today? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. It's a pleasure to speak to you uh, at the moment. I'm well, we chatting are to you from uh, the backward little welfare state of um, Uruguay. Yes. Tell everyone where that is in South America. Well, it's uh, just north of Argentina, across the Plate River. Small country, only three to four million people, hard to say. Mostly cattle land, soybean land, with... Um, with uh, a city very close to where I am. I'm out on a, a farm. Everything in Uruguay is a farm or beach or both. Uh, and my farm is very close to the beach uh, near Punta del Este, which during uh, December and January is a very jet setty kind of place. And then it, like, uh, then it turns into uh, just another beach town, quiet. The whole country is quiet, but very pleasant which is why I'm here. I'm often either here or in Argentina across the river. And you are quite the world traveler. I know you have a place in Aspen too, right? Mm, that's true. I've been in Aspen for over 30 years. But, you know, um, I've visited over 150, 155 countries, most numerous times, lived in 10 countries. And um, now I spend most of my time in Uruguay and Argentina, but the northern summer is still in Aspen. I like it. It's a people's republic, just like Uruguay. Of course, almost every place in the world is a people's republic today. Now, what do you mean by people's republic, Doug? Well, it's been going on for a long time, but um, let's say for at least 100 years, the whole world has become more and more statist. Uh, all over the world, governments have become more and more powerful and have impinged more and more in the private lives of their subjects, I hesitate to say citizens. Uh, this is, you know, people whine and complain about what the government does from day to day, but this is an accelerating trend that really started around the time of World War I. And uh, it's accelerating now, even now. Uh, accelerating at an accelerating rate, actually. So um, I like uh, being here a lot of the time because in a small backward country like this, they're inefficient. They leave you alone. I can pretty much do exactly what I want to do. It's nice. You have the freedom. Well, to me, freedom is personal freedom is a uh, primary value. Now, you know what? So we were going to start off with um, investors' mindset, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But you mentioned to me something fascinating that you're doing that I think our audience will love. You have a series of books that you have written, and I want to start off with this, Doug, just because it's at the top of my mind. Tell them what you were telling me. Mm. Well, I've had very good luck in the publishing business. Uh, my first book, which is called International Man, uh, became the largest selling book in the history of Rhodesia. Uh, it's a guidebook to how to make the most of your personal freedom and financial opportunity around the world. And uh, when I went to Rhodesia during the war, uh, I found a publisher there, we got along, and it became the largest selling book in the history of Rhodesia, which is incidentally a record which is never going to be broken. Uh, my second book was called Crisis Investing, and it came out in um, late 78, early 79, and talked about how the economy should fall apart or was going to fall apart, which it very nearly did back in the early 80s when we had, when the government was paying 15, 16, 17 percent 
to borrow money on the stock market at the lowest levels that it hit since 1933 and so forth. Uh, and that book became the largest selling book of 1980. Then uh, I've written other books and they were all quite good, but now I want to do novels because you can say things in the form of fiction that you probably had better not say in the form of nonfiction. So, um, this series of seven novels, first one was Speculator. Um, it's about our hero, Charles Knight, who starts out at age 23, gets lucky on a small gold stock, goes to Africa to check it out in person, and gets involved in a bush war with uh, boy soldiers and all the rest of this type of thing. Um, it's a pretty exciting book. It talks a lot about the way the mining business and the mining finance business works, in addition to the way bush wars work in Africa. And um, then uh, Drug Lord, which is the second book, picks Charles up. Uh, now he's age 30, and uh, he comes back to the U.S., and he gets involved in the drug business, both the DEA-regulated drugs and the FDA-regulated drugs. And he makes an absolute fortune on both of them, just as he did in the mining business. Uh, but as in the mining business, the government steals all his money from him, or most of it. So he's now a bit unhappy. And that leads to the third novel, which I'm putting the finishing touches on now, called Assassin, where Charles figures that there are some people that just need killing. And uh, here, uh, we discuss the history of assassination. Who is right? Who is wrong? Is assassination a good idea or not? Is it moral or immoral? Uh, it's about political assassination, which is rather topical, because I know that <clears throat> a lot of people want to uh, do bad things to uh, Donald Trump. So um, I, th I think the book might sell well. It's a well-written book with lots of information on not just the morality of uh, killing people, but the techniques of doing so. And uh, then it gets, then, then the novels will become even wilder and woolier after Assassin. But that'll be out in a couple of months. So uh, we can talk about that later, I guess. Yes, when sir. When the book is actually out. But in the meantime, <laughs> I'd urge your listeners to uh, go to either Amazon or highgroundbooks.com and get a copy of Speculator and Drug Lord. They're very good reads. Indeed. And the beauty of this is there's a whole lot of truth in this so-called fiction, right, sir? Absolutely. Because you <laughs> can say things in fiction that you dare not say in nonfiction. So um, I'm a big fan of fiction for that reason. And it's, it's not dry and hard to read like a lot of nonfiction is, besides... Yeah, I think our audience will find it absolutely fascinating. That's why I wanted to start off with that. Now, let's go back to my first original question. I want to ask you about the mindset right now that most investors have that we're seeing. Um, and the overall picture, Bank of America is showing 19 out of 20 valuation metrics that they follow as overvalued. And... Also, the NASDAQ and the S&P are the most expensive in history. Why do you think that investors are not taking their profits right now in this environment, Doug? Hmm. Well, most investors don't know anything about investing. Um, they're trend followers. And there is some wisdom to that because you should make the trend your friend. and. Uh, the market's been going up. Well, why shouldn't it keep going up? But that's not really the way I see it. Um, I'm uh, inclined to be a, uh, a bottom fisher. In other words, I like to buy things that are demonstrably cheap. I'm not opposed to following trends, but um, I'd rather, for safety's sake, and right now, I think we're on the cusp of what I call the Greater Depression. Um, this market has been going up since the crisis of 2008. And why? Well, part of it is a cyclical recovery from what almost happened back then. But most of it has been money printing on the part of the Federal Reserve. They've created trillions and trillions of dollars. And it's not just the US Federal Reserve that's done this. 
It's been the Bank of England. It's been the Euro powers. It's been China. It's been Japan. Uh, and all the little countries, they've all created money by the bucket load, or I should say currency. Uh, because uh, the paper that we trade today isn't really money. It's currency. and Governments substitute for money. So most of that money has flowed into the financial markets. It's flowed into the stock market. It's flowed into the bond markets and into the real estate market, especially real estate, because it floats on a sea of debt. And with artificially low interest rates, real estates look very good. But it's all a bubble. And um, it's all floating on a sea of debt, all of this is. So there's going to be a comeuppance. It's all cyclical. Uh, and when it all collapses because of the huge amount of debt in the world, uh, which people may not be able to service in the future, uh, it's going to be ugly. What happens when, for instance, a company that's borrowed a billion dollars, uh, which isn't much money anymore, um, what happens when the economy slows down and it defaults on that billion dollars? Where do the billion dollars go? Poof, it dies and goes to money heaven. And that's somebody else's asset that's vanished. And that that collapse might make it po impossible for the people that own that asset to make good on their own liabilities when it becomes a daisy chain. This is one of the problems with debt. There are a lot of other problems with debt. So um, I'm looking for very hard times in the very near future. Oh, long answer to your short question, sorry. No, we love it, we love it. Um, now, when you say um, very near future, what are you thinking? Oh, I think things should have. I hate to say should, uh, but um, they certainly could have collapsed years ago. Uh, but um, if the government creates huge amounts of new dollars, which is what it's been doing for the last 10 years, uh, that can keep the ball rolling. It, it, look, inflation makes people think they're richer than they really are. Supposing we don't look at the country as a whole, supposing we're just in a town, and let's say that the government of this little town decides they need to get things going uh, or keep things from collapsing, whichever way they want to look at it, and they deposit $1,000 in everybody's bank account on a Sunday night. Monday morning, everybody wakes up, hey, I'm a $1,000 richer. So what happens? They go out and put down a down payment on a new car, down payment on a swimming pool, down payment on a house, and all of a sudden there's line thousands. Why not? The thing is, is that these things are artificial. You get richer by producing more than you consume, not by living above your means. And that's what debt does. It, when you borrow, you get, the, you get that capital, either from savings that others have made in the past, you borrow it from them, or you mortgage your future. So that's what's been going on with all the debt in the world. And when the government creates money, as in this little example I gave of putting $1,000 in everybody's bank account on a Sunday night, it creates distortions in the market. Somebody will go out and buy a car that really can't afford it, but he thinks he can afford it because $1,000 of paper money went into his bank account. So you can write books about this type of thing. It's hard to summarize it in the course of a couple sentences in an interview. But um, yeah, I'm pretty bearish about the financial future uh, and the economic future uh, of the U.S. and a few other places, I've got to say. You know, that brings us, Doug, to precious metals. Gold was very strong in 2019, and um, central banks have been very enthusiastic about buying up gold of late. Now, in the past, you have actually been criticized about talking about the future demise of fiat currency and the benefits of holding gold. And it's very interesting that everyone is now coming to your perspective. But let's talk about gold for a moment because you have likened this period of time as being akin to 1971 
when there were great changes under President Nixon. So talk to us about the comparison and the big picture of both gold and silver. Well, uh, I'm a gold bull, and I have been for ever since I started learning about economics. Why? Because gold is the only financial asset that is not simultaneously somebody else's liability. Uh, you don't have to trust anybody else. You don't have to rely anybody, on anybody else for it. And the problem with the U.S. dollar is that it's really nothing more than a computer entry at this point. The government can create unlimited numbers of them at will that it spends for its own purposes. So I really don't want to own dollars. I prefer owning gold. And when it comes to speculating, uh, from time to time, uh, I like to speculate in mining stocks, which can be a very leveraged play on gold. And, and that's basically where I am right now. That's what I do with most of my money now, either commodities in general, or I should say gold in particular, uh, get my attention. Uh, I'm not interested in being in the general stock market right now. It's in bubble territory. And the bond market is in hyper bubble territory. So don't, I'm not interested in them. Wow, that's interesting. Now, you have made fortunes for many thousands of people through your advice through the years for the predictions and the companies that you hold that the companies that you hold and so on and so forth and i want to give a few tidbits to our audience while we have you here we have noticed that you um have followed a strategy of Ross Beatty who he's recognized and famous for um turning about eight million dollars into 1.2 billion for his shareholders and we noticed that you've invested in some companies that sort of maintain that same strategy and so i'd like you to go into that could you give us an example of a company and also um what are the founders and the management qualities that you look for when you're investing in something and when you're also advising it to others well you mentioned ross Beatty. I've known Ross for about 30 years, maybe more. I think it's more. Um, and when you're speculating in mining stocks, and I say speculating because you can't invest in mining stocks. Uh, there are too many imponderables, too many variables that you can't really quantify. That's why people like Warren Buffett never ever invest in mining stocks in particular or resource stocks in general. Okay, but if you're going to speculate in them, uh, the most important thing uh, when you're looking to buy a company is the people that are in back of it. Now, I've put together what I call my nine Ps. It's a mnemonic. When you get up to nine, I can't even remember them all now. I have to write them down. but there are nine things that when you're looking to buy any stock, but mining stocks in particular, uh, you should look at number one is people. And people is more important than all the others put together. The others are property. You have to know about how do you assess the property that they're looking to mine. You have to know something about geology. You have to know something about mineralogy. You have to know something about chemistry and the recovery of the minerals. There's all kinds of things. Okay, you've got people, you've got property, you've got politics. What's the government like? What are they going to do to you? You've got PH financing, financing spelled with a PH. Can they get the money? Can they get enough of it? What do they have to pay for it? And five other P's that are important when you're investing in these stocks. But people is number one. And I'm glad you mentioned Ross Beatty because he's been called a broken slot machine because everything he touches turns to gold. He's a good guy. Maybe he's gotten too rich for his own good because he's in Davos right now with all these miscreants. I hope he's not too badly corrupted by the process. <laughs> exactly. Please um, name a company for us just that people should look at right now as far as mining stocks go. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very hard to make a recommendation. Um, 
in a circumstance like this because people tend to run out and buy things on a tout and maybe the company I, I'm rec I could recommend is very good or maybe it's bad, maybe it's good for somebody like me, I'll hold it for a week, <laughs> not for a year. So I hate to recommend companies uh, because um, things are always changing and before people buy a company, they should actually know something about what it does other than just take the word of somebody that says it's a good idea. Now, with that preface, uh, for somebody who's a newbie in the mining business, in, in speculating in mining stocks, uh, one, I'd say the safest, definitely the safest, and one of the highest potential parts of the business is royalty companies. These are companies that don't actually own a mine, but will advance money to a mining company in exchange for a royalty on the metals that are being mined or may be mined in the future. Let's say you pay 2%, you, pay a, you give the company a million dollars because these companies are constantly raising money. They don't have any income. Uh, they're, they're spending all their money in drilling and overhead and God knows what, land payments. So they're, they're, they're always looking for money. A royalty company might go up to a mining prospector or developer, give them a million dollars and say, okay, we like your property, we like you, give us 2% of all of the gold or copper or whatever it is that you're mining in the future. Uh, royalty investing is, um, I'd, I'd say, the best way for a beginner to get into these things. And, and, and they're almost, it's the most successful part of the business. These things rarely dry up and blow away. So that's a tip. Look for a mining royalty company. And there are about a dozen of them out there today. Now, I know that Ross's strategy is to purchase um, uh, gold in the ground when it's very cheap and then to wait until the prices rise. I know there's other companies that do that too. Um, that strategy is maintained by a company called um, Gold Mining. And I know that you're interested in that one too. Describe that company for us. Well, uh, Gold Mining Inc. is run by uh, a friend of mine also, because uh, it's also important, I think, if you're going to start speculating in these stocks, try to get to know the managements personally. And I like to invest in companies that I know the people that are running it, and I know they're not the kind of guys that are going to steal the money or, or waste it. Uh, Gold Mining Inc. is run by Amir Adnani. It has about 12 or 15 million ounces of resources uh, in its various properties, mostly in Brazil. Uh, that's a lot, incidentally. Uh, that's a, a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, how many shares is it? It's, it's got tremendous leverage. Gold Mining Inc. is one of the companies that I own a lot of. Uh, it's a speculation on higher gold prices because a property that is not economic at $1,500 an ounce could be a bonanza at $2,000 an ounce. So it doesn't have – Gold Mining Inc., well, like many of these companies, is a bet on higher gold prices. Um, but it actually has the resources that are in the ground. So you're waiting for a higher gold price. Most of these mining companies or exploration companies, I should say, and there are about 2,000 of them in the world. There's lots of them. Most of them don't have any gold resources or reserves. A resource <clears throat> is where you know the gold is there, but it's not economic. A reserve is where you not only know it's there, but you know that if it's mined, you'd make money. That's the difference between a resource and a reserve. So Gold Mining Inc. Uh, has lots of resources, a little bit of reserves. Uh, it's a play on higher gold prices. Most companies are a play on the company actually finding something because they don't have anything, okay, if I'm making this distinction clear. Oh, so that's the difference. That's very interesting. Now, you spoke about gold prices. I want to turn back. What's your prediction? Where are we going with gold? I think it's going a lot higher. Um, 
here's why. Uh, nobody knows exactly how much gold has been mined since the dawn of history. But the best guess is that there's about 6 billion ounces of gold above ground. And unlike, let's say, wheat, where every pound or bushel of it is consumed every year, and there's very little left over, uh, gold is really not consumed. Uh, it's held as money, because that's basically what it is. It's a high-tech metal. More uses are found for it every year because of all the 92 naturally occurring elements on the periodic chart, uh, gold is the most durable, the most inert, uh, the most malleable, and the most ductile of all metals. This means that it's in effect a high-tech metal uh, with more uses being found every year, but that's fairly trivial. Um, where, where was that before I started talking about uh, the, the nature of gold? Um, the price. <laughs> we want the price. So you to get off on tangent when you're talking about these things. Uh, why am I bullish on gold? Okay. Uh, I said it earlier uh, in our conversation. It's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. And most of these central banks in the world, their major asset is U.S. dollars. But the U.S. dollar is the unsecured liability of a bankrupt government. So the fate of the dollar in the future is going to be pretty much the same as the fate of the Argentine peso. It's, it's just a figment of your imagination. It has value because it's convenient and the U.S. government is powerful and it can tax wealth. And give the dollar, it gives the dollar value. That's the only difference between the um, U.S. dollar and the Zimbabwe dollar. Uh, quite frankly, they're both fiat currencies. Uh, I prefer to own gold, and a lot of governments have been buying gold in the last few years. Why? Uh, the Russian Central Bank and the Chinese Central Bank and a whole bunch of other central banks don't want to hold dollars. Why should they hold the unsecured liability of a government which is at least their antagonist and may become their enemy. So they're dumping them like hot potatoes. Um, and, uh, but what are they going to use to trade between each other? The Chinese don't want to take rubles. They don't trust the Russians, and the Russians don't trust the Chinese with their yuan. So this is what money's all about. They both own gold, and they can trade gold with each other. And this is the same that's happening all over the world. So there's going to be a lot more buying of gold in the future. There's about 8 billion people in the world and about 6 billion ounces of gold in existence. Uh, and most of the people that own it uh, are going to keep owning it because it's an asset. So I think that the price of gold could go a lot higher. There could be a, a panic into gold because there's a panic out of paper money. So I'm uh, quite bullish on gold, 1500 And I've been in it since just above $35. So. Yeah. And I've never sold an ounce. Sorry? And I've never sold an ounce of gold. That's what I thought it's you said. You've never sold. It's something you accumulate and use for savings. That's the way people should treat gold. If you want to speculate, you should use the mining stocks. But if you want to save, you use gold. Two different things. Excellent. Excellent. Now, we thank you so much for that tidbit on um, Gold Mining Inc. I'm going to go a little bit further with you here on suggestions for our audience. Um, your website is amazing, caseyresearch.com. You cover investments such as investing in the flaws in 5G and AI and um, technology where you say the rich um, may never have to worry about dying. Um, some of these are incredible, Doug, and I want you to name possibly the top um, technological advancement that you see that could um, change the world on a global basis for investors. Yeah, well, that's a good question, Michelle. Uh, most of the time, whether I'm here on the farm in Uruguay or in Buenos Aires or in Aspen during the summer, uh, other than 
getting an hour of exercise every day, what do I do with my time? Mostly what I do is um, try to learn things, okay? I find it more amusing than just watching Netflix all day. Uh, mostly science and technology, okay? So I accumulate a lot of useless information, or it appears useless. Uh, because it has no immediate application from day to day. Um, but uh, the more you know, the more you can put the dots together. Okay, that being said, uh, every week I do an interview for CaseyResearch.com about something. Could be anything under the sun, but it's usually pretty interesting. And also a different one for InternationalMan.com, uh, different interviews. Okay, so I've covered a lot of this stuff in the past, but just another tangent I got off on for a moment. You asked me, uh, what's the big technology that's going to change everything over the next X amount of time? Hmm. Well, listen, uh, you probably are familiar with Ray Kurzweil. Uh, I don't know. Are you familiar with that name? Just I've wondering. heard the name, but not beyond that. Please tell us more. Well, he's the chief technology officer for Google. Um, but more important, uh, he became a centimillionaire or perhaps a billionaire on his own with technology companies. He's really a, quite a genius. And um, he wrote a book, which I do recommend uh, your, your viewers by, it's called The Singularity. Uh, essentially, he's predicting, for very good reasons, that in 20 to 30 years, no more, uh, the entire nature of the world is going to change because of technology. Uh, in other words, uh, the world's technology is advancing at the rate of Moore's Law. It's not just computers that are doubling in power every 18 months or two years and dropping their costs in half. This is happening in many areas, biotechnology, genetic engineering, space technology, um, nanotechnology, which I think is going to be the biggest of them all. And actually, this is all part of the ascent of man. It's been going on in a hyperbolically accelerating curve from 2,000, 200,000 years ago uh, with the conquest of fire. And then 100,000 years later, the invention of the bow and arrow. And then 50,000 years later, the wheel. Well, that was much later than that, but it goes like this, okay? And uh, we're at the point now where with the rate of acceleration, curve is going hyperbolic. Um, it's past the knee of the curve. Uh, magic things are going to happen. So my best advice to anybody out there is make sure you live another 20 or 30 years so you can take advantage of it. Because if you do, chances are you won't have to think about becoming decrepit and dying when you're 80. You might be able to live at your peak into the hundreds, okay? That's one consequence of it, but there are many, many others. So that's what technology is all about. So uh, I think it's important that people be aware of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, the stuff on your website is fascinating. Go into your perspective on the flaws um, in 5G for us, for anyone who has not read your articles. Well, look. Uh, I have a cell phone sitting right in front of me over here, uh, but I haven't used it for, oh God, for months. It's not even charged now. The uh, thing is, can be useful. Sometimes it's essential, like when I'm traveling or I'm at a convention. It's very convenient to be able to change appointments and that, but most people are glued to the damn things today. It's like their alternate life. Um, so I, I try to disconnect from, uh, the, um, the cell, the cell phone world. 
Um, and 5G, which is coming out now, really is going to be very important because it's going to, as I'm sure you're aware, allow a doctor in San Francisco to perform an operation in New York robotically, which is another area which is growing the pace. I mean, I don't doubt that 20 years we're going to be walking around with um, biologically correct robots that aren't made out of steel and plastic, but are real flesh. And this, is, this, is, this is science fiction is what we're talking about. So look, 5G is great. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I don't need or want a 5G phone. Uh, I still like to read paper books. Uh, and if I want to get electronic, I use my computer. The computer's open. The office is open. The computer's closed. The office is closed. I don't like to be attached to a cell phone where anybody can bother me at any time and leave a long message I have to respond to. So, look, from one point of view, 5G is absolutely wonderful. It's a step on the way to the singularity. From a personal point of view, I mean, not everything is relevant to all of us as individuals. And I don't see how 5G is relevant to me. So, so there, there you have it. Uh, I, I do think that um, most of the hysteria about the dangers of 5G with uh, microwaves constantly bombarding you, I think, that, um, I think that if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, going from gamma rays to x-rays and then the visual spectrum and then down to microwaves and so forth. I, 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 I doubt that it's really going to be damaging to you as an individual. It's just going to inconvenience you that you're going to be looking at the damn thing even more than you may now. So anyway, I'm not investing in that stuff, incidentally, because we're in a stock market bubble and everybody's investing in it. And things that everybody knows about and everybody's doing, you shouldn't invest in. That's where I wanted you to go with that. Number one, the health risks, your perspective on that. And number two, everyone's flying into 5G. So your perspective is stay out of where everyone's flying into and go into things that, uh, as you mentioned before, um, undervalued like gold mining ink or things that are the, the management behind them. Be very careful rather than watching the crowd. Right. The health risk, I think, is trivial. I mean, there's always health risk on almost everything, but I think it's relatively trivial on 5G, even if you live in the city where, you've got trans where you'll have transmitters all over. But I don't live in the city with trans. So for me, it's non-existent. Right. And investment risk is what you should worry about. And um, I wouldn't do it. I think the risk versus the reward is way out of kilter. Okay, great. So you'd go into gold and the other companies that you mentioned and any other tidbits of advice while we've got you here? Hmm. Well, where do you want to put your money? Um, look, I think we're going to have a really turbulent time coming up, um, especially with the election of 2020, because the U.S. is really divided into two countries with different values, different ways of seeing the world, different philosophies, different everything. And they hate each other. They really do. These people in the blue counties and the red counties, I don't know why they call the red counties red counties, because red's always been associated with communism, socialism, but they call the Republican counties red. I don't know where that meme got started. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I think the U.S. is almost at the edge of a civil war. And as much as um, a lot of people, you know, the woke types, the social justice warrior types, people that go to college, which is incidentally a huge misallocation of both four years of time and lots and lots of money, idiotic in the case of most people, they think they need this. Uh, you give yourself an education. A college doesn't give you an education. I could give you a lecture on, on that. I always counsel high school kids to think about all that time and all that money and how they might better employ it. 
but that's a whole separate conversation. I'd love for you to go into that just a little bit, just a little bit, because it's a very strong point that people don't many times take into consideration. Yeah, I misallocated four years of my time. And at the time, uh, university was affordable. But I don't know what we paid. Georgetown is today still one of the most expensive universities in the U.S., and I went there for four years. Um, but if I had good counsel, and, and, and then going to college was fairly exclusive. Not everybody did it back in the 60s. No, everybody does it. Uh, and going to college was not especially corrupting back in those days. Um, the professors generally profess whatever their subject was. It wasn't a course in political indoctrination. But today, and I speak as somebody who's been a trustee of two colleges, so I have this with boots on the ground, not just idle observations. The managements and the professors are almost universally captured by cultural Marxism. They're all ultra leftists. They're all indoctrinating the students who are pre-indoctrinated by grade school and high school. So, you know, this meme of socialism and wokeism and social justice warriorism and gender politics, there's a couple dozen of these things. It's, it's been insinuated in society and it's really corrupted society. Uh, it's good cause for pessimism. Um, but if you... If you're idiotic enough to send your kid off to college for four years, it's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to corrupt them. Much better, since people should and actually do educate themselves, is figure out, gee, what should I do with that? Let's say, not an outrageous number. You could spend much, much more. $200,000 and four years of time. Uh, Just shows how unimaginative most people are. I mean, one thing I would do is uh, spend a small portion of that money and a year or two of time traveling around the world with a backpack. And during that time, making sure that I read a new book every week. Now, that's for openers. That's just for a couple of years of that four years. You're going to be so far ahead of the game. (laughs) I mean, Christ, you could go off and you can't. But uh, if you were a male, you could. You could join the French Foreign Legion for five years, and you'll be way ahead of some idiot that goes, goes to uh, college for four years. I mean, there's all kinds of alternatives. I'm, a, I'm amazed at the stupidity of, of the average American that, that, uh, <laughs> that they misallocate, or I should say waste, that's actually more accurate, all that time and money, and give it these horrible people that run these colleges even worse anyway it's such an important point because most parents right now are pushing themselves pushing their child into this college yes this is this is further proof that people don't think for themselves in fact they don't think at all i mean they just do what seems like a good idea they're doing the opposite of what they should be doing It's, it's it's crazy Absolutely. Now, I want to circle back to that final question of uh, what advice you would give everyone. Hmm. Besides, don't go to college. <laughs> My advice. Well, that's, that's part of it. Uh, look, try to produce more than you consume and save the difference. That's how you become wealthy. And you should uh, do your saving in, in the form of gold. And you should get an education. There's lots and lots of good books to read. Don't subscribe to an expensive newsletter. Waste of money. Do not do that. And I speak as a publisher. Uh, There's lots and lots of good books that are available for a few dollars. (laughs) That's all. A piece. And read them and think about them uh, before you put any money in the stock market. Okay? And don't be afraid of um, FOMO. Fear of missing out. Mm. Got to get into the stock market now. Everybody's making it. Get into the stock market now. Chances are absolutely excellent. You're going to lose most of your money. (laughs) It's the worst time to get into the stock market. So uh, 
save money, put it in gold, and read a lot of books. And then when nobody even, not only doesn't want to hear about the stock market, they won't even care the stock market exists in five years, maybe. And uh, that's when you should get into the stock market. Right. So that's some good advice. Doug, with everything you know, I mean, you truly are one of the most successful investors in the world. Your wealth is incredible. Your knowledge is incredible. Your connections are incredible. If you took everything you have and know right now and you were starting off, what would you do? Hmm. Okay, what would I do? Um, after you have the basics down, if I was a young male, not sure this works for a young female. Might, but it, I'm not sure about that. Uh, so let's say that um, I'm in my early 20s and I've got the basics down. I haven't wasted my time in high school and thereafter. And I wanted to make a fortune, I would go to Africa. Expound. Yeah. Yes, go to Africa. The reason is that you want to be on an on-level playing field. You don't want to be on a level playing field. Uh, and if you stay in North America, there are millions and millions of other young people just like you. You've got no marginal advantage over them. Uh, however, if you take a little bit of money and yourself to Africa, you will be unusual. And if you have any moxie, within a month, you might be able to sit down with the president of some dog shit country uh, and open up a lot of doors with interesting opportunities. So uh, that's what I would do if I knew then what I know now. And you can still do it today. That's still a good, it would have been very good advice then, and it's still good advice today. Exactly. So over Although here. then, hmm? yeah, in the 60s, if you did this when I was in my 20s, in the 70s, um, yeah, the Orient might have been a better bet than Africa then, but the Orient, forget about it. They're much richer than North Americans now, more sophisticated. Uh, so you're not going to bring any, anything special to that game. Uh, Africa is where you want to go. Right. So the, the advice is open your mind to the whole world and take a look at what's out there. Yeah, absolutely. Very few people will do it. We'll find excuses not to. Oh, isn't it dangerous? Or, oh, gee, I got a good job offer with XYZ company, of which there are thousands. So anyway, I'll just say it. Uh, not that anybody will do it, I suspect. <laughs> it's amazing advice, and I bet they will, actually. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's your type of perspective that opens the mind of people that are sort of in this cookie-cutter type of life you know what I mean? And have their parents pushing them into a cookie cutter type of life that's only going to head for a lot of debt, a lot of competition, and a lot of um, disappointment in a life that could have been absolutely spectacular. Yeah, it's no fun being a hamster on a treadmill, but that's where most people wind up. It's sad, but true. Doug, this has been an amazing interview. Please remind everyone where they can go to follow your work. Oh, well, I want to recommend my novels, Speculator and um, Drug Lord and Assassin, shortly at highgroundbooks.com or Amazon, of course. And um, I do uh, lots of interviews, wide ranging, on internationalman.com and caseyresearch.com. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. Well, my pleasure, Michelle. Thank you. Mr. Doug Casey, best-selling author, expert investor, and the founder and chairman of CaseyResearch.com. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.